Welcome to Binary Jazz, a podcast about things. I think I have a smooth, silky podcaster voice today because uh, I'm still recovering from COVID, which I had this last week. And uh, this is your second why, time having That's it. why, yeah, it's the second, number two. Number two. How- and and the, the first, first the first time the first time was pre like before vaccinations really existed publicly they were just barely trialing them so um, publicly was... we had our our back alley yeah back right yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean like if you were in a clinical in trial you could have gotten them but obviously uh, yeah. so so yeah this is like you know vaxxed and boosted three times or something and yeah i think we just got our boosters over the summer so yeah it's fun uh you're saying uh how's this compared to last time yeah that's what i was asking yeah um i mean i'm here and it's less than a week so that's the thing um i was completely knocked flat for a good week last go around um and um Last time we also lost our smell and taste, and I think this time I did have some issues that were similar. Like I had dinner the other night and I just couldn't taste it, but I think it might have just been because I was just so stuffed up. Um, it was it was really weird though. It was really extreme as far as something funny about that. I was just imagining you like putting salt on and like. Well, no, it was it was a really. It was a More really salt. spicy like dish that I oh. that I first had in Sri Lanka, and I got a recipe for it when I came back. And so it's like spicy, and it's like got lots of like curry and spices in it, and like, and like I tasted like bits of like fried stuff and like and the bell peppers because they were like sort of like caramelized. Like I I tasted mm. sweet and I tasted a little bit bitter, and that was about all I could get. Um, you know which was very similar to when to when we completely lost because we had like Indian food, uh, and it was the Indian food, and they're like, did something? Did they make it different this time? Like what's? And then like, and then we started doing like sniff tests with like essential oils and like, can you smell this? Like, like, no, yeah. Oh, um, I also had an observation. We have uh, adjusted our recording time and our conversation. Oh yes. I'm going to get a copy of that wallpaper. <laughs> uh, we have just a recording time and our uh, our food conversations, which I will take full blame for, have uh, died down quite a bit. <laughs> I don't bring up food nearly as much, nearly as often. Because this is right after lunch for me. Until right at this moment, where well, now I'm just hungry. <laughs> yeah. 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 You you jinxed it. Get so it. there's um, there's some um, Oreo. I Oreo is like a... It's not a healthy food. It's not a healthy snack food, but it's 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 one of those that I I I do from time to time. Have you have you either of you tried the Oreo cakesters? They're like, I mean, I'm not suggesting you poison yourselves with this because this stuff will survive, you know, whenever. Um, well, past the apocalypse. Um, on the back of the individual package, it's two like Oreo cake things. I mean, it tastes like Oreo, but it's cakey. I don't know. That's the best way to describe it. Cakey Oreo. Um, on the back, there is a note that this contains genetically modified ingredients, um, which I kind of love. I don't know what they are, you know. So I'm going to Sounds- share in uh, our Slack, and then I will share it in the show notes of this episode, uh, a link to a YouTube video just as soon as it comes up, uh, a college humor uh they did a series for a while that were like messages from ceos and it was all the same person doing them uh and they have one message from the ceo of of oreo um so uh yeah that college humor chocolate peanut butter pie oreo recently i know that's actually why i bought them i walked down the oreo aisle oreo aisle it's it's not like the full aisle but i walked past like where are you shopping this is sounds yeah and I just, I always like stop, like I always look and see, is there anything that I need to try because it looks crazy? And I was like, oh, there's that. And they were labeled BOGO. So I'm like, well, okay, that means I need to get two packages, obviously. Double so, down, yeah. <laughs> what did I go there for? I think I went there for guacamole and that was it and came home with like Oreos and... I have not investigated the new Oreo type. So this is all completely new 
information to me. And and this is and this is the problem that is discussed in uh, aforementioned uh, uh, college humor uh, video. <laughs> um, but what I was going to say before that um, about Oreos is that no, I have not tried any new Oreo things at all uh, for a variety of reasons. But um, I keep getting an ad on. Hmm. Uh, I want to. I, I want to say it Instagram. Oh. Uh, that uh, um. That is for a custom Oreo that you can order, presumably on a website somewhere, wherein it's it's a covered Oreo. And you can mm. cover it in like white chocolate or dark chocolate. And it's got a little like rim around the outside of like sprinkles or something. And in the middle of the sprinkles, you too can add your very own personalized picture to be printed on the Oreo cookie. And and I am told by the advertisement, advertisement, that mm. this is a very romantic personalized gift to give your loved one what holiday are they what holiday are they not for you would be the retort <laughs> any occasion is the right occasion perfect for weddings bar mitzvahs St. patrick's day <laughs> gender announced gender reveals <laughs> it's it's a white oreo i don't understand or it could be either yeah, that's the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, peanut for the butter, people in the peanut future. Peanut butter ones sound fascinating to me, but my, like, but my partner doesn't do peanut butter, so that would mean that the responsibility to eat them all would be up to me. I, well, I have good news on two levels then. First, there's probably no peanut butter in it at all. It's just, it's called chocolate peanut butter pie. There, I mean, it's probably just all chemicals. Um, second, uh, it's perfectly reasonable to eat an entire package of them. <laughs> Not in oh, one I didn't city. say it was two or reasonable. three. <laughs> I yeah. just said, do I want to? Do I want to eat that amount of bunker food? <laughs> that's, I mean, that's why I don't purchase them often because I eat them and I'm like, well, all right. You know I, what I, I saw at our grocery store, though, they sell single sleeves now, which I didn't. Mm. Anyway, I was just like, wow. I was like, that's smart. And I had, like a, a weird way of tricking yourself. I had Oreos for breakfast once upon a time in um, an airport in China. I had a, like an early flight and caught my cab from the hotel and got out to the gate because I wanted to get there plenty of time to, I don't know how to get around airports and foreign languages. Um, well, local languages, languages I don't speak, foreign to me languages. Um, and so like the only thing around was this like, that was open was this gift shop. And I'm like, I went in and they had like a sleeve of Oreos. They had some other things that I really couldn't identify. And I'm like, well, I know what Oreos are. Yeah, and I had Oreos, and um, I, it 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 looked like it was going to be orange juice, but it was like a, it was more of a mango flavor. I don't know what kind of juice it was. It was supposed to be orange, but it wasn't. That was breakfast. Well, orange. you uh, thought orange. it was supposed to be orange. I mean, based on the image on the side, it looked like it was. It should be orange. But I don't know. I'm. I mean, I'm not that picky. It, Unidentified fruit. It was. It was definitely a, a fruitish juice. Fruitish. <laughs> it was. It was fruityish. <laughs> So there I was with a Kindle bounced on my knee, eating a sleeve of Oreos, drinking orange juice. Living really your wish best I had coffee. Life. Right? It was pretty amazing, <laughs> honestly. When I talk about it that way, it was <laughs> it was cool. Um, I I have told you all about the trees coming down. Yes. At our house, Wednesday was tree day. Um, so at I don't know a seven forty five. Knock on the door. Foreman introduces himself. He's like, I just want to walk out and cover the project with you to make sure that, you know, we're all on the same page. Like, there are three huge trees in the front yard. Yes, those are the three. <laughs> the only three trees in the front yard. We can confirm this. We're grinding these stumps. Um, and he's like, you know, what What I need to be aware of? And I said, well, I'd love for you to not hit the house. <laughs> <laughs> just some some yeah. ground rules on my end. Well, well he said, he, he was just asking, you know, like, you know what are there any shrub like bushes around here that you're you know super we need to be super worried about i'm like anything around here that you know he said the, the bottom of the bottom line is things are gonna be falling and we'll do our best to avoid damaging things but we're gonna point them towards 
other bushes rather than your mailbox in the house because mm -hmm. and they may get damaged in the process sorry totally fair um then the crane showed up and um he was like can i park here on the lawn i'm like yeah go ahead and he didn't really park or he, can i park here in the driveway he didn't actually park in the driveway he was like straddling the driveway wheels on the lawn um and um by like 8 30 the crane was hooked up to pieces of the first tree there was a guy in like a bucket lift up there with a chainsaw there was another dude whose job was to keep sharpening blades on the chainsaw so he could trade out sharpened chainsaws with the other guy that was up in the tree. And then these pieces started coming down and I was supposed to be working and I could not tear myself away from the window and or walking outside and watching because it was just fascinating, horrifying for, <laughs> for both of those at the same time. And um, uh, and then by- I mean, 11... I think the original uh, etymological word for that is awesome. Is it? But it has been repurposed. I mean- Okay. Full well, of that's... awe. Yeah. Which can be, which that. can encompass both those things. But, you know, that's sort of been repurposed. There were, there were like eight trucks. The road was shut down. There were 12 guys running around. Every time a branch fell, it was off the driveway into the grinder. There were people with like rakes and leaf blowers, like keeping everything under control the whole. It was, this team was, it, it was awesome to watch. It was horrifying because it was at my house. But one of the trees, you know, three feet from the corner of the house, no problems. Took it down. I have like a couple, you know, things. I have a piece of granite that got, or for granite walk that got, you know, chipped when something heavy fell on it. And I have like a, an, a piece of edging that got cracked wood. That's it. It was amazing. And I was blown away how fast and inconsequential it was and how quickly those trees went from being here to being mulch. And like, I'm actually still a little, uh, out of sorts from it. Mm -hmm. How did um? How's the fam? Yeah, taken? really. That was that was the next question. Yeah. How, did, how did everyone take it? <laughs> um. Yeah, it went well. We we did we went outside the night before, and like thanked creation for the trees and all the things that lived in them and appreciated them. And my oldest was like, "I'm not doing this crap," and he was. You'd ride a bike, but I was like, some people opt in, some people don't. Yeah, that's fine. It was totally an optional thing, and yeah. uh, uh, and then, um, it was, I think it was yesterday. So, uh, my middle was like, I really appreciated that we had time to say goodbye to the trees, and I'm like, well, mission accomplished. So, that's nice, yeah. and they all have ideas of what should go in next because we do need to put something in, it can't just be. I mean, I guess we don't have to, but we're gonna put native plants in and you mm. know, all that kind of. Uh, stuff so we're starting a list checking it twice yeah and for those of you in the future that's a reference to um an old uh, concept called santa claus and he was before um mandated spying uh, santa claus was who spied on you mandated <laughs> spying by way of uh elf by on amazon. the shelf yeah by amazon Amazon spy via app, Elf on the people. Shelf. I think they just call it um, no series Apple. What is it, what is Amazon's called? Alexa. Alexa. Yep. Alexa's spying on you now. Boy, I missed an opportunity to be um, in a spy agency. I, th I think I could rock like like nickname of Alexa. You know? That's exactly what someone would say if they were in a spy agency, though. That you missed You're an like, opportunity. Oh, to be I a just spy. missed my opportunity. And like, <laughs> Maybe. I'm not I'm not a spy. I don't know what you're talking about. As I like take notes on this call. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he always takes notes on the call. We never see them. <laughs> <laughs> I have had to do interviews um in the last two weeks of developers. Um weird. Weird. Like weird to be on that side of things or I haven't I've never yeah, I haven't never done it. Um, I've been like a person sitting in, but I haven't been the one like leading. So it's like, can you come up with a series of technical questions? Like, I yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Will they be helpful in identifying anything useful? Nope. But I can come up with technical questions. <laughs> yeah, I we my interview process for my current gig, uh, the technical part kind of got zipped through a little bit. Um, because the person that was going to do the technical interview had to go away uh, for uh, sort of like emergency parental leave because his wife was in labor that day. 
uh, like went reason. into labor that day. It's a very um, good reason. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I ended up having an interview instead with his brother, who is a project manager who had already interviewed with. Um, and I think it was more like, do we need to have this call? Probably not. Maybe we should just pass you on to like, I don't know, someone else who can ask more technical <laughs> questions. Um, but a lot of that stuff was already kind of covered in previous interviews. And then since then, I've been involved in a couple interviewing processes. And we, I think what's often done or has been done is like there is a, a, a test project thing. Yeah. Um, and the idea is that you do that on the call with people watching and kind of like talk through the process. I don't know how useful that is either. I, I went, so, I went to several of these and like, yeah, I can get a sense that you know what you're doing ish, I guess, yeah. but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, you're going to work well with the team or, or any of the other things. And like, I assume you know what you're doing if you got to this point, like I assume that I would have filtered you out. Like it's not, it's not giving me any new information. It's just validating the information I already had. I feel like my role is to number one, say like, um, uh, can you actually like write code? Like yes or no. And then um, how, how well can you do that? Like, or how well can you convince me that you can do that? How well can you bullshit? Um, and how confident are you in your bullshit? Like that's kind of really all I can get out of it. Like I this podcast, like. really. <laughs> it's, it's pretty much the common theme of my life. Yep. <laughs> yep. It's the thread I mean, that runs through everything. I, I feel like the most valuable thing to be on the hiring end of a technical-ish interview is to, it's more about, for me, it's more about the intangibles. It's more about like vibe and like, um, does it feel like they know what they're talking about, even when I don't necessarily know what they're talking about? You know, um, in the case that I can think of most recently, I, we were interviewing Drupal developers. I know nothing about Drupal. Do they know about Drupal? Can I tell that they know about Drupal? Can, yeah. Are they telling me things that I don't know? And am <laughs> I understanding those things that they are telling me? You know, like that that matters a lot more than can you jump through this particular hoop uh, to do this particular, you know, coding challenge. It's, I, yeah, I have found two problems. Um, one, um, coming in, like having no idea what I'm doing. I was asking yes or no questions. Like, do you know much about dot, dot, dot? Mm. Well, yes or no. Like, that's not. Yeah. And then. Um, I and Tell I me asked, about how you've used dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Yeah. What can you, or, or how, how, you know, how would you like, I don't, yeah. Yeah. Um. But ultimately in those, like, I actually don't care what the answer is. It's like some of that technology is like, fine, you can learn it. Some of you, like, you don't have to learn like whatever. I'm just curious. Um, but it's like, I feel like that uncovers like, like stuff that they're excited about. And then it's like, oh, mm. we can dialogue on this for 15 minutes. And that's yeah. like where you kind of unpack the, like, like yesterday, uh, a person I was talking with was like super stoked about accessibility. Like, all right, like, let's roll. That was fun. You know? Um I think a lot um, of this also just applies to people who are like mid-level and beyond because like I think technical interviews might be more important for people when they're bringing on a junior to know Ooh, interesting to know what kind of assist like what kind of level of assistance they'll need to level up yeah and do they have that type of like time attention to contribute to mentoring the junior developer yeah so we're definitely going junior um which is also i mean i'm stoked about like i've gotten we have two yeah and in, in those cases I have time like to work with and yeah. in those cases when you're targeting someone that's more junior it's like does this person feel like they have the um impetus to learn and also the ability like they know how to seek knowledge they know they they understand how to learn new things um mm -hmm. which is not you know especially yes. 
especially in, in, in our current academic system, it's not necessarily a given that people know how to learn. Um, yeah. It's a skill that you, that you acquire um, by seeking out knowledge on your own as opposed to being fed the stuff that the school gives you. Um, like you're looking for outside stuff. Um, and does this person know know where and how? Do they have strategies they can use to to figure stuff out? There's been varied. Um, I'm like, you know, is there anything I should look at, or do you have a GitHub profile? Is there anything I should like I should look at in it? Yeah. Like, you know, don't, there's no requirement, but is there anything I should look at in it? Uh, university. The first question, the answer is yes. The second question is like, uh, maybe sometimes. Oh, here's one, you know, but focus on this part. Like, totally cool. I get that. Um, uh, but it's really hard to um, balance that concept of like, wow, this person has a lot of repos versus this person has two repos. Like, there's actually enough, like, quantity is, is I don't mind, like, I don't, and, and like, completion. Like, boy, they've started a lot of things and haven't completed. Well, hmm, hmm. I've, I happen to, like, think, like, what, what, would I, what would I think if I came to my own GitHub repo and I just laughed? I'm like, oh, yeah, like, this would be like, like, yeah, how did... <laughs> How did I ever get a job? Honestly, like <laughs> it's just like a it's like it's like a cemetery of projects or ideas and it, like whatever. I don't care. Um, I feel like most of my side projects I'm more excited about than any of the actual work projects I have. Yeah, <laughs> same. So the uh, like majority, like ratio yeah. wise. Yeah. Um, I, like, oh, I'd much rather tell you like where the nearest place is to get guacamole than. <laughs> any website build I've made. <laughs> yeah. I get really excited early in a build, uh, in a like, personal project. And then I get into it and I'm like, oh, I should add this and this and CI and automated testing and deploy and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like- Oh, so you like, oh, you over, not over engineer, but no, like- No, I totally over engineer. It's out, absolutely what it is. Yeah. You out feature yourself basically. Yeah, I PM myself to idea. death. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not an enterprise project, but I want to. I want to make. I want to put everything in there. I want to try all the things that I. I want. I want static analysis. I want unit tests. I want integration tests. I want feature tests. I want automated deployments. I want uh, like like automated deployments that with no downtime. I want, I, I, like that. Why? Like no one cares if it goes down during the deploy for thirty seconds. It's like it gets like ten hits a month. Who gives a crap? It's, but, <laughs> I I want here those things. I want those things too, but I have the, I don't know if it's presence of mind or just laziness mm. to not necessarily go down the rabbit hole to do those things all of the time. And, but on the other hand, um, a lot of the time it's those personal projects that are the testing ground for understanding how to do those things in other contexts so like if i don't do those things on my own stuff then when i want to do those things on a regular project i might not know how to do it uh and i'll be starting from scratch whereas if i did it once before then i can say oh yeah i've done this and i can i have my own project i can fall back on to to look at for source uh for source material and prior art type stuff yeah but how valuable is that in the days of AI, like <laughs> you have to remember. Well, anything. yeah, that that now I probably don't need to do any of that because I could probably just ask, ask Chat GPT. Um, I I was half kidding on that. Um, I ran into um a pull request today by another developer who is mostly, um, JS, and uh, it was some PHP work, and they used um named parameters, which is like a a feature in PHP eight point oh, um. And I was like, I, I literally sent a message and said, is this, uh, how much of this pull request is, is uh, AI? Uh, hmm. He said, why do you ask? I said, I'm not like, I'm not like picking on you. I said, I'm really curious about this line right here, uh, name parameters. Like what, you know, did, is, did you decide to do that? Or is that something that, that Copilot did? And he said, no, I, I like that a lot. I'm like, all right, let's roll with it. Let's do it. So. That's it. That's that's the that's the that's, that's the thing. The but yeah. but somebody asked me uh, after one of these interviews, somebody that was one in president president one of the interviews sent me a message and said, "Is there a policy on AI written code around here?" And I'm like, 
not that I'm aware of, but I don't think yeah. it matters anyway because everything goes through a pull request and code review. And so at some point, like maybe AI wrote it, but pull requests are pretty, uh, pretty ridiculous around here. <laughs> Yeah, there was a um, there was a post in one of the WordPress Make, probably the one of the community Make blogs that was about the use of of AI code in like plugins in the WordPress plugins repository, and it was not stating anything new, just sort of reiterating the idea that as a maintainer of a plugin that is hosted in WordPress.org, you are responsible for all of the code in that plugin, and the licensing terms of said code yeah um, and ai doesn't necessarily know what the licensing is for any of, and and honestly like there's places where it might be vague like if it's scraping stack overflow who owns that i, I don't know um but the assumption is that that the code that goes into your plugin that you got from you know chat gpt or wherever is also was always is originally open source and there's not really a way to verify that but i yep. guess there could be a, a a takedown if like somebody from from like rocket genius found code that was explicitly ripped out of gravity forms or something that like was obviously such and that you know they could bear but like I, I don't know how you would you know like there's no way of, of enforcing that really other than saying yeah did you know wag finger don't do this i guess yeah. um mm -hmm. pursuant to i was um i opened a pull request on symphony documentation the other day to fix a sentence and i've done that in the past on other projects where i'm like reading documentation and a sentence it's just clear that, like it made it through editing and wasn't fixed it happens um um and so uh, I was like, it's sometimes like you do that and it's, it's like months and you'd like this pull request ends up getting closed or merged or whatever. You're like, oh, I forgot I did that. This one was handled in like three hours and with a nice, like, Hey, thanks for fixing this and making it better for everyone else. Like I, it didn't cause me to go look for any other things to fix, but hmm. you know, it was, it was a nice experience. So props to symphony. That's all I thought there was a point there, but I didn't find it. <laughs> You didn't do land you, the plane. <laughs> well, no, do, you we'll have a, do you have a stock tip, Gary, or or should we? I feel like I was telling uh, Aaron about our last um, our last episode, wherein we were talking about um, books, and uh, and she was asking, "Oh, do you have a book review section now?" I'm like, "I think, I think yes. I think we kind of <laughs> do have a a book review segment." Um, so if there's not yeah. a Gary stock tip, we could we could go to the book review segment because I did no, actually finish no. something in the last week. <laughs> Um, I haven't, but I, I'm excited about a book can I, that I haven't read yet. Okay. Um, if you're familiar with the nap ministry on various social medias, um, the woman who started the nap ministry wrote a book called rest is resistance and, um, a manifesto. And I'm excited to read it because I love the nap ministry <laughs> and I love resisting by resting. <laughs> Uh, so I finished, uh, I finished, um, what's it called? Uh, Act Your Age, Evie Brown. Mm. Uh, but mm. this is not going to be about that. So then I, I, uh, I then read in the in-between because I was trying to figure out what, what next to read. Um, I have a couple uh, copies of H.P. Lovecraft stories that I pulled from uh, Gutenberg.org uh, when I first got my Kindle. Um, and so I read The Color Out of Space which is one of the things, it's one of the stories that is sort of on various Lovecraft reading lists. Like if you're reading Lovecraft, you should read these things. Um, and it's the second Lovecraft story I've read. And it's funny because this color out of space is literally about a color out of space. <laughs> <laughs> it comes from space and it is a color. And what's interesting about it so Lovecraft is all about, from what I've gathered from reading and also like reading the actual works, but also reading stuff about him, it's all about like, I mean, there's there's the term like cosmic horror, which gets thrown around a lot, but but more than that, it's about like 
ambiance and like m setting a very particular sense of like mood and dread and creepiness right and so what i found interesting uh in a kind of bizarre way was how much creep factor could be could be inserted into a story that is essentially about a weird color <laughs> like literally like literally that like a cloud that is i mean it's it comes in various forms but one of those forms is just a cloud of like weird color that doesn't match any visible spectrum but is still somehow visible like like that that is that is the whole thing that like what it sounds like is what it is and and <laughs> I mean, and it does bad things too, but like, of course it does because it's Lovecraft, but like, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is building up to this sense of, of dread and horror that comes from really something that is not at all tangible. And what was, and so like, I paid attention to like the ways in which he was describing things because I'm reading this partially to like, I don't know for like academic, like I'm interested in his, his method sort of reasons. Um, and, and it's all, it's like a lot of just like the ways, like the surrounding things are described, um, which it, it's just, it's just really interesting. It's like, it was like, it was like, it was as if he wrote it as a thought experiment. Like, can I make the most ridiculous thing possible hmm. sound scary? I don't think that's actually the point. I think the point was he's a very disturbed man who's very afraid of everything. And it felt very agoraphobic too. It felt very like much of, of fear of the outside, fear of going out into yeah. open space and looking up at the stars. Like just this very like feeling like this person feels safe in very closed, confined places and going outside is scary to them. Yeah. I can't remember which story I've read, but I found it really claustrophobic. Yeah, yeah. Huh. <laughs> like I just was just like, I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. That might make that might make it onto my list then, just for the experience of it. it it's it's not long, uh, and like I said, you can get a lot of his his stuff on on Gutenberg.org. So, um, uh, Gary says he has a couple stock tips. I do have two stock tips. The first one is sad. Um, the military industrial complex is cranking up again with uh, excitement over near uh, Taiwan and the Chinese Sea there. Um, and Boeing has lots of orders for 737s coming in and uh, theoretically will be putting uh, astronauts out near the moon before the end of the year in their capsule. So I think Boeing is, a, uh, is one option. Second option, we're far enough past the Silicon Valley Bank implosion but a lot of regional banks are still um, value super depressed, so their um, dividend yields are 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 uh, ratios are super high right now. So probably a safe time to get into well researched regional banks that you feel comfortable with. That's, that's a, a very that's a very heavy. There's a lot of work being done by that asterisk at the end of that. <laughs> well, I don't. I mean, like I, I could say like well, Bank of Hawaii, but I mean. That's when I happen to have some money in, but I actually think it's a little bit risky, you know, for many reasons. But I think Hawaii is one I'd call out. Um, RBC is a good, probably an okay one. I don't know. You, you like, you do your research. Don't, <laughs> don't take my word for it. I love it. I love the Gary's, Gary's stock tip is all about do your research. Don't, like, don't take my word. Look, don't, don't listen to me. <laughs> but I think that do your due diligence. Yeah. I so I read about I thought it would be fun to write about stocks at some point and then I read in um the SEC has some crazy regulations about that kind of stuff like mm. if I did that in like put like Thank you for listening to Binary Jazz. If you like this episode, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. You can visit us online at binaryjazz.us or follow us on Twitter at, at binary jazz special thanks to serpiente negra ensemble for the use of their tracks for our intro and outro music you can find them online at serpientenegra.bandcamp.com don't forget that you can ask us a question through the forum on the website or on twitter and we'll read it aloud on the next episode of binary jazz